morning, everyone. How you doing? It is so great to have you. This is going to be an absolutely incredible week at Shoreline because Wednesday night, we're having relationship night with Jimmy Rollins. And he is so much fun and insightful and passionate about developing relationships. And so we want to encourage you, if you want a boost to your marriage or to friendships or to understanding how to interact with other people better, you want to be here on Wednesday night. It's going to be a life-changing uh, time together. So please join us this Wednesday night. And then I want to tell you about what's happening next Sunday. Everyone shout out next Sunday. Because next Sunday, we are going to have a very special Christian group that joins us for King and Country. And they are one of the most popular musical bands in the world. And they're going to be performing at South By. And then they asked us if we would be willing to host them on Sunday morning. And it is going to be absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and we actually have a personal invitation from from, uh, from the band uh, uh, that I want to show you. Take a look. Shoreline Church is Joel and Luke here with For King and Country with a special announcement. Picture this. Picture. A little music. Joel and Luke with For King and Country. Yeah. March the 10th, you and us. Can't wait. Uh, we've got something special to share with you as well. So stay tuned. We'll see you then. A very awesome and amazing service. And, uh, and we, we kind of felt it was strategic because next weekend is time change uh, Sunday and it's not the good one. All right? It's when you spring forward so you lose an extra hour. And some people, the devil speaks to them in that moment and tells them, hey, don't go to church. You lost that extra hour. But now you've got more than enough reason to join us next Sunday. It's going to be absolutely off the charts, amazing, amen? All right, let's all of us stand to our feet. While you're standing, I wanna give a huge shout out to all of you that are watching online from around the city, around the community, around the country. Uh, we had over 20,000 uh, Shoreline Behind Bars uh, members join us for services last weekend. And so it's, give them a great big hand clap. We love you guys. So great to worship together. And uh, we're going to start our service today like we do every single week. We're going to recite our Shoreline Creed. It's just a collection of phrases to remind us that Christianity is all about God's amazing grace. You guys ready? If you're new to Shoreline, you can just read along. The rest of us, we say that with some enthusiasm and passion. Here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give God praise for that. You may be seated. I understand that not everybody here today is, uh, you know, totally into sports. I, I'm a huge fan of all the different sports throughout the seasons, but this is kind of the low moment in the sports calendar, especially if you're a passionate football fan. You know, football stopped, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and it's not going to start again for a couple of months. And so I thought I would kind of ease your pain by giving a little, you know, football humor here this morning. Uh, someone uh, went up to Roger Staubach and asked him uh, if his 1977 team could beat the current Cowboys. And Roger said, uh, I think we could, but it would be close. It would be like 10 to seven. And the reporter asked him, well, why would it be close? And he said, well, we're all in our 70s and 80s now. <laughs> you know, this morning, as we do every single Sunday, we gather together, we have a huddle for all of our volunteers. And we have the most incredible volunteers. We call them our three team. Come on, give it up for our volunteers. All the people who serve here at Shoreline, they're amazing, incredible people. But we have a huddle on Sunday mornings before service, you know, just to kind of talk through the day and give a little uh, encouragement, you know, as we serve together. And as I was coming out of the huddle, there were two greeters at our, at our service, the first service, who said to me, they said, boy, you're really looking good today, Pastor. And I don't know what it was about the way they said it, but it really encouraged me. 
And I just wanted my wife, Laura, to know that I still got it. I still got it. What? <laughs> if you didn't hear her, she said, whoever it was, take him. <laughs> we have been in the last, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been in a collection of talks on the subject of identity and how important it is to, to believe your God-given identity. And we're going to conclude this collection of talks today. And hopefully as we as we process this information, we're gonna live in the victory that God wants us to live in as we experience the revelation of the beauty of who he's really designed us to be. And so we've been talking about it and the way we've been you know, kind of encouraging you to think about it is, is that there is at, at the bottom, there's this foundational truth about our identity that you need to embrace. I think it's like, it, it's like the difference between night and day. It's like 180 degrees apart from the way most people think. Uh, most people think that we're just a, a mistake of evolution, that we're an accident, that there's no really divine purpose. But the Bible teaches us something about our identity and he launches this thought in Genesis chapter one in verse 26, which by the way, is the first mention of mankind in the Bible. And this is what the Bible says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. You are made in the image of God. And if you believe that, if you rest in that, if you trust that, it will change everything about your perspective. You are not a mistake of evolution. You are not an accident that just happened. You're not here by chance, regardless of the details of your birth. You are an on purpose creation of God made in his image. Let that settle in your heart for a few moments this morning. Let the, let the truth of that saturate you. You're made in the image of God. Now, when you read through the Genesis, Genesis account, you'll know not only are we made in the image of God, but then in Genesis chapter three, it talks about how mankind uh, decided to, to launch uh, into independence and go their own way and sin unfolded in the human race and all of the suffering and pain and darkness and all the flaws and issues in our own life were a byproduct of that particular decision. But then God, in his love for the human race and his love for the world, John 3, 16 says that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so not only do we have this understanding that at the bottom we are created in the image of God, but because of Jesus, we've been recreated. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 21 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now I can't unpack all of the truth of that again here this morning. You're gonna have to go back a couple of weeks if you missed any of the lessons in this particular series, I encourage you to go back and listen. But this particular truth is mind blowing that we are made by grace, right with God, that we are complete, that we are sons and daughters, that we are no longer sinners defined by our behavior. We are saints defined by what he has done for us. So that's the foundation. We're made in the image of God, recreated in Christ Jesus, made brand new. And then last week we talked about how we have a unique human identity. In Psalm 139 in verse 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There is, there is no one like you. You are a one in a hundred trillion gazillion billions unique. There's nobody like you. you. You have a unique set of talents and abilities and experiences, and you have a personality and a gift mix that, that separates you from every other person in the world. Now, here's where it gets good. And this is where we're going to conclude today. I believe that God 
takes the foundation, this idea that we've been created in the image of God. And then on top of that foundation that we've been recreated in Christ Jesus, and he fuses that into your personality, your gift mix, your uniqueness to give you a personal God imprint identity that allows you to live your best life and accomplish your purpose. I think we underestimate how much God knows about us and how intimate he wants to be with us. I think we underestimate that in a massive way. He knows everything about you. He knows everything that happened to you on your way to church today. I know that might scare some of you because you cut somebody off and then they pointed the way to heaven. <laughs> he knows the fight you got in with your spouse. He knows the trouble it took to get here. He knows everything about you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Amen. Knows everything about you. And Jesus was trying to communicate this thought that he knows everything when he said he even knows the number of hairs on your head. Something as insignificant as that, God knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. For God to do that for Pastor Yuri is very easy. <laughs> for some others of us, it's more difficult. But he knows everything about you. And you know what? He wants you to know the reason why you're here. He wants you to know your unique identity. He wants to reveal that to you, to nurture it in your life, to grow that in your life so that you would live in victory and accomplish the reason why he put you on this planet. To help you understand the uniqueness of the God identity that God wants you to live with and, and understand, I wanted to show you that there are a few times in the Bible where um, this unique identity that God wanted to imprint into someone's life was so meaningful that he actually changed the name of the person so that they would identify with their God-given purpose. The first time that that happens, and it only happens like four or five times in the Bible, but the first time it happens, it happens with Abram. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse four, you will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which by the way, means father. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. So God changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, the meaning of Abram father, the meaning of Abraham father of many nations. So God is so interested that Abraham would own his new identity that he actually changes his name and does the same for his wife. Sarai, which means princess, he changes to Sarah, which means mother of many nations. He's so interested that, that they would understand their identity that he actually changes their name so that they would embrace the purpose for which he has assigned them on this planet. Let me give you another example. It happens again in Genesis uh, chapter 32. It says, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. The word Jacob means deceiver or supplanter. And that was a part of the identity that Jacob had. Could you imagine, you know, naming, naming your son Supplanter? You think about all the names you could choose to have for your kid. Hey, we're gonna call you Deceiver. But anyway, Jacob's name meant Deceiver. And then he has this interaction with an angel and, and there's a new name given to Jacob. You were Deceiver, you were Supplanter, but now you are one who wrestles with God and prevails, and we're gonna call you Israel. So he wants Jacob to be so in touch with his new identity that he actually changes his name. Fast forward to the New Testament, we have this example with, with, with Simon. You know, so Simon is one of the apostles, followers of Jesus, and, uh, and Simon actually means to hear or a hearer, and 
when Peter makes the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus turns to Simon and says, I'm gonna change your name. You're no longer Simon, just somebody who hears. You are Peter, the rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. It was like Jesus saw in Peter a leader that he could shape and use to build his kingdom, and he wanted him to identify with his purpose so much that he actually changed his name, okay? Now, I don't think that you have to change your name in order to understand your identity. So this is not a message about going to the courthouse and changing your name. This is a message, however, of changing how you see yourself. God has an identity for you, a specific God identity, and he wants you to live out of that and nurture that and grow in that. Let's take an example of David from the Bible. He's one of the most complex and studied uh, Bible characters of all time. And people who have studied his life have determined that it seems like there was a fourfold identity that God wanted David to understand about himself. He nurtured it, he confirmed it, and over time, it was how David saw himself. I'm sure it was a combination of the fact that he was created in the image of God and he knew that, that he had a relationship with the living God, that God had blessed him with unique talents and abilities, and God fused that all together. And over time, David saw what his God-given identity was. He was a warrior who had legendary military exploits. He was a king who was loved and honored. He was a poet that wrote almost all of the Psalms that you read about in the Bible. And he was a shepherd. His most famous words, the Lord is my shepherd. David saw himself as a shepherd, a poet, a king, and a warrior. And that was a God-given imprint in his life. And when he lived out of that, oh my gosh, incredible things happened. When he lost sight of that, oh, there was all kinds of treachery that unfolded. So when we talk about our identity, we're not just talking about a nice subject. We're talking about perhaps one of the most significant things that you can understand about your life that will determine whether or not you live in victory and accomplish the purpose that God has assigned to your life. Believing and walking in your God-given identity empowers your best life. When I was thinking about this in my own life, I was thinking about, God, who did you make me? And as I was kind of going on this journey personally, and I'm just sharing with you my personal example so that maybe you can adopt it in the way that it seems best for you. But I said, God, when I'm at my kingdom best, who am I? And I realized as I thought about it and as I prayed about it, I'm at my kingdom best when I see myself as a trusting, surrendered follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when I'm at my best, I see myself as a trusting, surrendered follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the best way that I could picture that, and I know it's not very flattering, but there's a, a lamb inside of me. A lamb is a trusting, surrendered follower of the shepherd. And I just thought, you know what? There's a part of my identity that when I'm at my best for the cause of God's kingdom, I'm a trusting, surrendered follower of Jesus. But then I also noticed as I look back over my life that almost every environment that I was a part of, that I would almost naturally you know, lead that environment. I would lead my baseball teams growing up. I would lead my Bible studies. I led my youth group. And when I got to college, I was selected as a leader for the dorms. And it just seemed that I, like I was always gravitating towards a leadership position. And I, I said, when I'm at my kingdom best, there's a passionate leader on the inside of me. And I thought, how can I best 
illustrate that so I can remember it. And I thought to myself, you know what? There's a lion on the inside of me. There's a lamb, a trusting, surrendered follower. There's a lion on the inside of me, the, this passionate leader. And then I, I, I thought, you know, there's a part of me that's an ambassador. I'm a, I'm a communicator and I'm a representer of the kingdom of God. That's a part of my identity. And I'm not saying this to say that four is the magic number, but if you pray, God might show you who you are, a combination of the fact that you're created in his image, that you're recreated in Christ Jesus. It takes into account your unique abilities and who you are as a person. As I was praying about it and thinking about it, and it took weeks and weeks for me to kind of settle these things. But I said, you know what? There's a lamb inside of me. There's a lion inside of me. There's an ambassador inside of me. And then when I thought about the fact that I tend to be an adrenaline junkie and I tend to take high risks and I love to mountain bike and I don't ever come back mountain biking without some scrapes and bumps and bruises. And I love to scuba dive and I love to, you know, to sail. I love to ride my motorcycle. These are like thrills you know, that, I, that I experience that, that have something to do with how God wired me. And so I said, you know what? There's an adventurer on the inside of here too this lover of life and all things good when I'm at my best. Now, I'm a little bit even embarrassed to, to share this with you um, because these are kind of private and personal, but I share it only as an illustration to say, you're created in the image of God, recreated in Christ Jesus, given unique gifts and palance, passions and likes and dislikes. You, you have your own personality. And I'm just telling you, there is a stamp on your life, a God-given identity that God wants to help you discover. He wants to nourish it in your life. He wants to confirm it in your life so that you would live out of your authentic God-given identity. And let me, let me tell you how that works. Just a couple of days ago, I was out playing golf and almost every single morning I'll wake up and I'll say, I want that lamb in me to, to be expressed. I want that lion to be expressed. I wanna be an ambassador today. I wanna be an adventurer today. I, I talk to myself that way. These, this is how I see myself. I wanna nurture it. I wanna grow it in my life. And let me tell you how, how, how it plays out. I was, I was playing golf a couple of days ago uh, by myself and I, I you know, went to the first tee and I was, you know, kind of connected with two other people that I had never met before. And so these are brand new people. And it turned out a husband and a wife, and they were from India. And he uh, is a surgeon and she is a, um, a child's pediatrician, okay? So he's an ear, nose and throat surgeon. She's a pediatrician. And, uh, and so we're just playing together and, you know, having some fun and laughing together. And around the third hole, they asked me what I did for a living. And so I told them, well, I'm the pastor of Shoreline Church. Uh, being from India, they were Hindus, but there was such a respect in their eyes for the profession that I'm a part of. That doesn't happen all the time. A lot of time people hear I'm a pastor, they roll their eyes. But there was such this tender, and they actually, put their hands like this as if to thank me for encouraging the, the spiritual community that we're all a part of. And I just found myself so endeared to them. And this is the third hole, you know, and they're doctors, I'm a pastor. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? There is an ambassador on the inside of me. There is, there is this identity of a, of a representer, a, a communicator of the kingdom of God. And I don't know how, but somehow in the next 15 holes, I got to keep myself from cussing when I hit a bad shot. <laughs> and somehow extend a credible invitation for them to experience our Savior and Messiah. And I wish I had with me what we have available today, which are our invite cards. And we wanna encourage you to grab these on your way out to invite people to Easter. But I did my best to invite them to our Easter service and maybe they'll come. But part of my identity is an ambassador and I wanna represent his kingdom well. You have an identity, a God-given imprint that he has put in your life that will help determine the pace of your life, the victory in your life, the purpose of your life. When I think about David, 
shepherd, poet, warrior, king. When he lived out of his identity, he was unstoppable. He went to the, to the battlefield where Goliath was shouting his curses against God, and he stepped up to the plate and defeated Goliath. You know, when, when he was, uh, you know, involved in leading military campaigns and then Saul got jealous because, you know, David was, was killing his tens of thousands and Saul only his thousands and he had to run away. He lost everything. He lost his, his friends and his family. He lost his job. He lost everything except his identity, the most important thing. And because he saw himself as a warrior, as a king, as a poet, as a shepherd, he gathered together, you know, 400 disgruntled people, you know, that, you know, were just gathering out there in the wilderness. And he made them the fiercest fighting force that ever existed. One time Saul was chasing David. He was in a cave and David was already there. He could have killed Saul but he didn't have to manipulate the circumstances. He didn't have to control the environment. His trust was in God and it just made him respond with grace and dignity. And he didn't have to control his own future. He trusted God to put him where he needed to be. His identity fueled his behavior. Your identity is so important that this is where you're gonna face the most attacks. Because if God can keep your identity strong, you will live in victory. But if the enemy can succeed in getting your focus off of your God-given identity onto a false identity, then all kinds of tragedy and treachery can unfold in your life. And I've seen it happen with me throughout the years. If I'm not a trusting, um, surrendered follower of Jesus, if that's not my identity, I can be pretty good at trying to control my circumstances. If, if I'm not, you know, a, a, a lion, you know, a, a passionate leader, I can sometimes be a, a timid kind of victim wallowing in self-pity. If I'm not an ambassador, I can be a silent bystander. And, and if I'm not an adventurer, I can just be a passive maintainer of the status quo. I can do that. I can live outside of my God-given identity and then all kinds of negative things unfold in my life. But if I stay focused on the lamb, the lion, the ambassador, the adventurer, my life is full of victory and joy. And I find myself just experiencing life where I know I'm bringing pleasure to God. And I just want to encourage you and challenge you to embrace your God given identity. Amen. Your identity is so important that this is where the enemy is going to attack. And we see this unfolding in the story of, of David's battle against Goliath, right? We see this in the beginning stages of David's life. You know, God's not happy with Saul. He's gonna find a new king. And Samuel, the prophet, is, is told by God to go to the family of Jesse, where he's going to find one of the sons of Jesse to be the next king of Israel. He gets to Jesse's house and Jesse brings all of his sons to parade before the prophet. And the prophet says, well, I see all of them, but the Lord's anointed is not here. Is there anybody else? And there was. <laughs> but David's dad didn't think enough about David to even invite him to where the prophet was. So they had to send a messenger out there into the where David was watching the sheep and bring David. And then the prophet said, yes, here is the Lord's anointed. Now, I, we love our moms and dads. Some of us have had challenging relationships with our parents, but most of our, our parents are good, they're amazing. But even the best of parents at times can maybe not reinforce our God-given identity, the treasure that is on the inside of us. I, I think about my dad. My dad, honestly, 
My dad believed in me. I had one of those rare, rare individuals that was a, a part of my world. My, my dad believed I could do anything. In fact, he told me on a number of occasions, you know what, you can be the president of the United States. He said, you can lead a Fortune 500 company. I don't know why, but he thought I could do anything. Eventually, as my life unfolded, God was calling me into the ministry. And when I told my dad that I was gonna come to Austin and start a church, oh, he, he struggled with that. He thought that that was far less than what I was capable of. He was looking at it through different eyes. He, he thought I could be the president. I could be a, 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 a corporate, you, you, you know, titan. I could, I could do anything. And he thought that me pastoring a church was stepping down. But here's something my dad didn't know. He didn't know that there was an ambassador on the inside of me, a God-given part of my identity. And even though he struggled, you know, with me starting this church, I got to tell you, when we had the grand opening of this sanctuary, my mom and dad were sitting right behind me. He whispered in my ear, this is exactly what God has called you to do. But listen, sometimes there are people in our life that don't see the treasure that God has put in your life. And the enemy is going to take advantage of that to try to discourage you from your true identity. You think about David, he goes to the, to the battlefield where Goliath is shouting his curses and his brothers and his friends say, what are you doing here? They didn't see the warrior that was on the inside of David. Sometimes, you know, we're without honor where people know us the best. Isn't that what happened to Jesus? He was without honor in his own hometown. Sometimes people who know us the best don't see the treasure that God has put on the inside of you. It doesn't mean they're bad. It's just that sometimes they can't see it. The third challenge to David's identity came from King Saul. This was before their relation got sideways, but David went up to the king and said, hey, I'll go out and fight Goliath. And Saul said, you can't go out there. You're just a boy. Take my armor, take my shield, take my sword, take my equipment. Theologians who kind of studied that interaction will tell you that what Saul was really telling David in that moment is you don't got what it takes. You can't do this. Saul didn't know about David's experience with the lion when the lion tr tried to take the sheep. You know, Saul didn't know uh, about David's experience with the bear when the bear came to steal the sheep and David put a stone in a sling and trusted God and killed the lion and the bear. And David told the king, just like the lion, just like the bear, there's a warrior inside of me. Goliath is going to fall. And then David goes out to face Goliath and we get the fourth challenge to his identity that comes from the enemy. And the enemy looks at David. And I, I wanted you to read this, so I, I got it here. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 43. He says to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? In other words, Goliath is challenging David's identity. And he says, you are so nothing, you're not even human. You're like a dog. You're, you're coming against me with sticks. And I'm here to tell you that's what the enemy wants to do to every single one of you. There is a God-given identity that God wants to nurture in you, confirm in you, that you would live out of, that's based on the fact that you are created in his image and recreated in Christ Jesus. It's a mixture of your personality, your gifts and your talents. He wants you to live out of that and be that. But I promise you the enemy is gonna speak to you and, and he's going to try to, discourage you. He's going to diminish your understanding of your God-given identity. He's going to call you a dog. He's going to call you a failure. He's going to call you a loser. He's going to say, don't even bother. But I'm here to tell you, you are who God says you are, created in his image, <laughs> recreated in Christ Jesus and filled with gifts and talents and personality 
to accomplish what only you can accomplish. I've had to struggle with this thought of my identity throughout all the seasons of my life. Even when we first started Shoreline. Laura and I, we reached out to our neighbors. Before we had our very first meeting, I knocked on hundreds and hundreds of doors, probably without exaggerating, like two or 300 doors. And I asked people if they would be interested in coming to a Bible study that was gonna be at our house. I would give them the card with the address. Some people just said, no thanks. Some people said, I might be there. But there was like 30 or 40 people who said, we're gonna be there. I was so enc encouraged. And on the night of the Bible study, we prepared some drinks and we also had some chocolate chip cookies. And that night, nobody came, not a single person. If you wanna know where my addiction to chocolate chip cookies started, it was then. And I was thinking about my identity. It was almost like it was right there, exposed. Some leader, you are. Some trusting follower, you are. Some ambassador, you are. I was feeling the arrows in my heart and in my mind. I remember thinking about this quote that I read in a leadership book. And it was like the devil was using it. He who thinks he's a leader but has nobody following him is just taking a walk. And that's kind of how I felt. How can I call myself a leader? Nobody wants to come. But somehow, some way, I dusted off that experience, tapping in to the lamb, the lion, the ambassador, the adventurer, tapping in to the identity. And I've had to do that my entire life. Somebody asked me the other day, do you, do you ever feel like quitting? Yeah, every Monday. Until I start tapping in to who God made me. And you know what? God made you. It might not be an adventurer or an ambassador. There's a, an ambassadorship for all of us that the Bible speaks about, but, but maybe he's made you an entrepreneur or maybe he's made you an inventor or a caregiver or somebody you know who, who has the ability to sing and create music and create life and, and, and maybe you know somebody who can inspire young people. There's something in your identity that's a mixture of who God made you who God recreated you to be, that's a reflection of your gifts and talents. And it's not just a job that you might have slipped into, it's a part of your identity. And if you don't do it, if you don't embrace it, life falls apart for you. But if you do, you live victoriously and for the glory of God. Identity, my friends. It's everything. My challenge to you, believe, embrace, affirm, nurture, confirm. You're created in the image of God, recreated in Christ Jesus, blessed with individual gifts and talents that God somehow supernaturally molds together to give you a God imprinted identity to walk in victory for his glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this incredible group of people. And Lord, we, we don't want to just survive in life. We want to thrive in life. We want to we live and reign in life. And we know, God, that that comes somehow, some way from understanding who we are. Father, make that rich and real in all of our hearts today, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you please stand to your feet here this, this morning? We're gonna take a moment to worship the Lord. And I wanna encourage you, with nobody leaving early or moving around, let's just enjoy the presence of God because He wants to pour into your heart here today that you are a champion. 
that you are victorious, that you're a son, you're a daughter. You are created in His image. You are recreated in Christ Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate the goodness of our God today. as you're standing here or you're joining us online, you're finding yourself in a battle for your identity. Maybe today you're finding yourself in a space where you feel rejected by God. You feel at a distance to God. You feel like a sinner as somebody that isn't worthy to connect with God. I believe that our champion Jesus has conquered sin and death and has conquered every bit of distance that there might be between you and God and has made a way for you to live in your Christ-given identity as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And maybe today is the day that you need to respond to that and to say, I believe that. Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the world, but He died for my sins. He died for my broken identity. He died for my sin identity. And He gave me a brand new Christ identity. So if today is your day, if this is your moment to respond and say, Lord, I'm gonna believe what Jesus says about me. I'm gonna believe what God did for me me and I'm no longer going to wallow in a broken identity, but I'm going to accept what God says about me, that I am a child of the Most High God, that I am forgiven and made brand new, that I am His and nothing can steal me from His hand. If this is your day, we want to pray with you today. So I want to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed within this room, I wanna ask that if you wanna respond today, maybe for the first time, or maybe you just need to reaffirm it and say, I'm coming back to Him today. I wanna ask that right there where you are, would you just raise your hands up high that we could pray with you? I see hands going up all over. Is there anybody else that says, that's me this morning? I see you. I see you over there. I see you guys up there. I see you. Can we pray this aloud and at once and just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. 
and I choose from this day forth to live in this Christ identity. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Can we give God a great hand? At this time, I wanna invite the prayer partners to the front. And if you have any prayer need, feel free to come and pray with them today. They're ready to pray with you. If you did respond, we'd love to pray with you today. If you put your hand up and said, this is my day. Also, you can text the word forgiven to the number 97000 and we'll connect with you there. Now, before you go, one very, very, very important Thing, okay, this is a big week. We've got relationship night on Wednesday night. Not only do we have relationship night, but Easter is coming, and you're the invitation team. Okay, Pastor Rob set the bar for us 200 doors that you've got to go knock on. Okay, so he showed us the way. But you know, some people you have friends, you have colleagues, you have neighbors, you have people at your kids' school. There are cards on the way out. Don't just grab one, don't just grab one for yourself, don't just grab one for your family. Grab one for our ever many people you're gonna see this week and invite them to Easter. You don't know, you might just change their life this week with that invitation, amen? So I'm gonna be praying that you're exceptionally uh, successful, more so than Pastor Rob, in your invitations, okay? Uh, this week, let me speak a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Bless you. Have a fantastic week. See you Wednesday night.